send it. Uh, also, please make sure that the video is also me talking. Yeah, we can start. Can you? Can you start? Okay, good morning, everyone. Myself, uh, Dr. Nitin from DKSH, and I welcome you all for today's Breast Cancer Awareness Talk. October is a Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and this month is extremely important because breast cancer is the commonest cancer in women in the whole world and in Singapore. The mortality because of breast cancer is also very high. In order to improve the breast cancer outcomes and survival, education and early detection is very, very critical. So today in our breast cancer talk, we will first hear about Breast Cancer Foundation Singapore and their various initiatives. This will be followed by sharing by a breast cancer survivor. And after that, we will learn more about breast cancer from Dr. Lee Guek Eng. She's from Icon Cancer Center. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions after the final talk. And please remember to type your questions in the Q&A box. You can see the Q&A box is at the top right of your screen. You can click on that and type your questions. And once it is typed, please click Submit. Our colleague Diana will facilitate the question and answers later. So with this, I would like to request our colleagues from Breast Cancer Foundation to start presenting. So over to you, Michelle. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and thank you so much DPSH for inviting all of us here today to share a little bit more about breast cancer, um, especially given that it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, but really the key message that we want everybody to take away with today is that to not only remember about breast cancer only in October, but really that breast cancer should be something that is important and in the forefront um, every day of our lives. Now, this is why we're all here today. Um, breast cancer incidences have been increasing very rapidly, and in the last 50 years, the numbers have actually tripled in Singapore. So the, re the most recent statistic stands with one in 13 women in Singapore will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. Now, the good news is that two years ago, um, we did a survey and we asked um, both males and females in our community um, what they thought of um, breast cancer. So the good news is that actually 90% know of breast cancer to be dangerous. And in fact, even better than that, they know that breast checks are important. Now, unfortunately, this does not translate to action. And this is why um, the BCF, we go out so aggressively with outreach because apart from just knowing about it and talking about it, we really need the, all the women in our lives um, to do their breast checks and whether this is breast self checks or mammograms. The numbers in Singapore are low compared to our Western counterparts. In Singapore, or less than 40% of women from 50 to 69 actually have their mammograms done. Now, the other question that a lot of people have, and in fact, this is something that I took for granted before I joined BCF. Oh, you know, breast cancer, I don't have to really think about it, you know. Um, the people I know, more, more, most of them have it when they're much older. Unfortunately, that is a fallacy because whilst most, the majority of women who get breast cancer are older, one in six women in Singapore with, with of breast cancer cases are actually um, 45 and under. And Trisha, who will be sharing with us um, today, can share more about her personal experience as well as that of our members. And this is why it's so important to be vigilant. Breast cancer does not discriminate. And whilst, as with any cancer, we can't stop cancer, we, we can't, right? It's really, it's almost normalized in our lives. Um, one of 50% of us will get some form of cancer in our lives. But with breast cancer, it is a 
unfortunately or fortunately a good cancer to get if you catch it early. So if you catch it stage two and under, we're talking about a fantastic five year survival rate of over 80%. Now, the risk factors, um, we're talking about age, family history, exposure to hormones, lifestyle. Um, if you'd like, you can ask Dr. Lee more about this in detail later. Now, what I would like to stress, and I'm sure Dr. Lee will be sharing this with you as well, is that 90% of the women with breast cancer don't actually have a family history. Now, we hear of Angelina Jolie, you know, the Angelina Jolie um, effect with the BRCA. So that's something that is quite familiar or something that we've we've heard of, um, but the reality is that actually only 10% of women with breast cancer have a family history. And in fact, in Singapore, 70% don't even have risk factors. So we have a whole group, a very large group of women out there uh, myself falling into this group where we think, well, we're young, you know, we lead a fairly healthy lifestyle, we exercise, we eat well, we don't smoke, you know, we only drink socially. Um, we really don't have to be worrying about breast cancer or any form of cancer. Now, really, that is a, a again, a myth. Um, really, it can happen to anyone and we really can't take our health for granted. Um, there is a screening schedule on the right. Um, and one thing I, again that I didn't know until I joined BCF is that we actually should be starting our breast self checks um, when we turn 20 and mammograms um, 40 and above. I'm not gonna go through the video today, um, there, but this is a step-by-step -step guide. I will share the link to the video in the chat later on. Um, but again, um, if you have any questions regarding um, the BSE, Dr. Lee is here today and you can please feel free to ask her more about that. Um, a lot of people suffer from anxiety getting a mammogram. I had my first mammogram done last year. I personally suffered from some anxiety as well because I heard it could be painful. Uh, what I did was that I threw a mammogram party. So I basically just joked some of my girlfriends, so a whole bunch of us went down and we had our mammograms done together. Um, so really, if there is always a way to get around it. Um, so again, if you do have, if you are nervous about getting a mammogram done, um, talk about it, talk with your friends, let us know, um, and we'll, we'll try to sort you out there. So a little bit more about what we do at PCF. We are an IPC, uh, we do have IPC status. What that means is that we are a registered charity. So for donations $20 and above, you do get a tax exemption. Uh, we have two baskets of work that we do. One is internal looking, which is basically taking care of our members. That means our cancer, breast cancer warriors, as well as their family. And then there is the outward looking, um, group of programs which largely falls under education, awareness and outreach and that includes our mammogram subsidies. Now I think many of you may not fall under this category but if you do know of women who are financially stretched especially during this COVID period, if you have a CHAS blue or orange card here 50 and above you will actually qualify for free mammogram screening under our BEAM program. Um, call us or call any polyclinics um, to find out more about it. So there really is no financial uh, obstacle to getting a mammogram done in Singapore. Some of the support group programs that we have, again, you can ask um, Trisha more about it. Um, she's She is a huge uh, advocate of our and befriender as well as a she plays a huge part in our support group programs as well. How we differ from other cancer groups um, and healthcare groups is that ours is a peer to peer program. What that means is that instead of having a counselor or a psychologist um, do the counseling, we really call it a befriending program. So what happens is that we will profile match the the uh, patient as closely as possible to a befriender and what what will happen is that the befriender having that shared experience will walk together with you on on your journey um, and similarly in our support group programs they are largely facilitated and led by other um, breast cancer warriors we also have a beat program um, and therefore different stakeholders including um, the survivors as well as their caregivers, um, as well as corporates. And what this does is that it is a really a structured and formalized um, 
program is a little bit academic in nature and it will equip you with skills again uh, for the survivors to better help navigate their breast cancer journey. Um, one thing I would like to highlight here um, is a WIC loan program that we have is currently suspended because of COVID, um, but nonetheless, um, do let us know if if you, if you know of anybody who needs this program, um, what happens is that, um, well, with chemo, we, there is great, there is hair loss. Um, it, when we do one-to-one -one personal consults, the, the, the patient comes in, um, the service is completely free. You just need to be a BCF member and membership is also free. We also have a prosthesis, uh, a pros thesis program, but that has to be done um, through a medical social worker in one of the restructured hospitals. Now, some of these support services, now with COVID, everything's gone online. We used to have a monthly program on the first Saturday, uh, second Saturday where we see everyone face to face. Now we do programs about twice a week virtually. Now, what I'd like to highlight is that last year, we actually started a young women's support group because again, young women do get breast cancer. And again, their concerns are very different. Um, Trisha will be able to share more about that. Um, and we also just last month started an advanced and metastatic group, um, support group online. Because again, for ladies who are in the later stage, um, their, their treatment journey and what is again most important to them is very different, um, can be very different from the other warriors. Healing Through the Arts program is something which we've just started actually, restarted physically on site about two weeks ago. Um, I'd just like to highlight that we do have a long list of programs. Go onto our Facebook and take a look. Um, I'd just like to highlight that how this differs from your local community club really is that um, there is a therapeutic element in all of the classes that we conduct. So for instance, for dragon boating, now that's been actually medically proven to help with lymphedema, which is a common um, side effect from surgery when if the lymph nodes um, from the armpit areas are removed. So in fact, that could help prevent or to manage um, um, lymphedema. Um, things like ukulele, you know, when you you have uh, you use your 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 fingers uh, more with sewing as well, um, that actually helps with um, um, the nerves. And also um, sometimes with the chemotherapy, there is a numbness and a loss of feeling, and that that helps with that as well. So on the outreach and education, we conduct talks such as uh, this with uh, DKSH. Um, Pre-COVID, we also used to do um, live events, meaning on-site events um, in wellness events with hospitals. Sometimes you see us at community clubs. Um, sometimes we do have standalone events as well. We do have um, memo bus deployments. Um, we also work very closely with corporates um, with them, and sometimes we do have separate outreach programs with these corporates. They can also sometimes be internal fundraising drives. Um, sometimes we also have collaborations where the corporates um, support us um, through um, volunteers. Um, so for instance, when we need, uh, when we have walks previously, we used to need hundreds and hundreds of, of volunteers and, and the corporates support us that way as well. Now, something that we launched just two months ago, and this is really something they're very proud of, um, is a a booklet, and this is currently an app e-booklet. You can download it on the right, uh, just download the QR code. Um, whilst it is, I have to stress, a fairly, so it is a solid um, universal uh, uh, breast cancer guide, there is a focus on young women in Singapore and their journey. And in, in, in addition to that, um, aggressive breast cancer. So I'm sure Dr. Lee specializing on young women is definitely in a better position to share more about why it's even more important for young women to be vigilant about breast cancer because they tend to they tend to get the more aggressive forms. Now, these are posters that I believe many of you might have seen um, in the HDB uh, lift lobbies. This is our campaign for this year, our BCAM campaign for this year, and we've really brought in 
COVID into the conversation as well, because with COVID, everyone's just thinking about COVID and really ignoring their health. So whether it's about breast cancer screening or other forms of cancer screening or even a regular health check screening, we seem to have forgotten um, about that, not willing to go into the polyclinics um, or because we're not back in the office, um, the, the offices are not uh, or the businesses are not able to conduct their annual screenings as uh, in the same manner. But we just really would like to send the message out there that our health screenings, all forms of health screenings, especially um, breast cancer, of course, remain important. Now, please, if you see the left um, QR code there, um, do do take do take uh, do download that. Um, that will give you actually a step by step. Um, breast self-examination guide in the four main languages um, and at the end of that there is actually also a booking form um, for a mammogram in our local polyclinic so um, please do download that. Our pink ribbon campaign continues to go out so you have about two more weeks to grab your pink pink ribbons which uh, pins which I'm wearing today. Um, some of the shops that you'll be able to see it include Famous Amos or the Estee Lauder um, counters or SIM. So please do support us. Again, I have to stress that our fundraising, we are a charity, we do rely on the generosity of of the members of the public to support us. So please do um, help to um, support us by donating for a pin. Um, we also have other online um, campaigns. So this is a Know Your Breast Challenge, um, which is really a tongue in cheek way of spreading more uh, about breast cancer awareness, as well as using it as a platform for, for fundraising. So please do support us there. We also have merchandising this year. Um, so you can go on to Lazada to grab these t-shirts. Um, we also have mugs available actually just yesterday and I haven't had a chance to update that. So um, again, there are mugs and t-shirts available this year. So this is my last slide. Um, this is another collateral that we have. It's called the Breast Book. You can get this off our website or you can download the QR code. Um, in addition to all of what I've shared earlier, um, this public, this Collateral also shares more about the types of breast cancer as well as the treatment options available. So this is really a very good one stop shop to find out more about breast bone. This is also available in the four main languages. So, you know, um, do take do take a look um, and also do share it with your friends as well. Yep, so I've come to the end and I will then um, pass it on to Trisha, I believe. Right. Yeah, Trisha, yeah. can you start presenting? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Um, just a sec. Hello, everybody. My name is Trisha, and thank you very much for inviting me, for me to have a chance to share my story. And I've been a Breast Cancer Foundation volunteer for more than a decade. So uh, I think uh, longer than Michelle, probably. <laughs> And uh, so I, I thought I'll just share a little bit uh, the face behind the pink ribbons and the behind those campaigns and the real person story. And hopefully that's something that um, um, what cancer have taught me, uh, some of the life's lessons, I hope to share it with you. All right, let's start. So um, I'm going to go through some of the life lessons such as impermanence, enjoy the journey, balance and gratitude. So hopefully it can inspire you in some way and uh, that is beyond the just just a sub story, a sub survivor story. OK, so I was diagnosed fairly early at 32 years old. Um, just when I'm planning career, family planning, I had my baby. Uh, she, she's three uh, nine months old at that time when I was diagnosed and I have a four year old son. And so everything just took a detour. So, so this is something that cancer taught me that impermanence. So a lot of things like um, when when something happens, we have to just deal with it as it comes along. So I went for treatments, I had chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, surgery, mastectomy, and reconstruction. And there is pain for sure, and there is hair loss. But all those things, I tell myself that. Um, it's not going to be there forever. And I find it very helpful uh, to remember that um, all those things are not permanent. And uh, it also taught me to really make the most of everything that comes my way and really live fully, even with the diagnosis. So 
my favorite quote at that time and even till now is in time, this too shall pass. So just like how um, COVID is with us right now, initially we're like, whoa, you know, but then uh, and then so COVID and cancer in a way it, 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 it's not welcomed. It comes, it goes. So we just deal with it as along along the way. Uh, so when when we are diagnosed, we want to have the acceptance first and then with the awareness, OK, I've accepted my cancer diagnosis. What next? Right? So it comes with the awareness and then I want to take action. So the reason why I put enjoy the journey is so once I know that I already have cancer, then what? When people tell me, oh, you know, Trisha, you can't eat this. No, you can't eat that. Then I'll be curious. Why? Why? What? What is good? What is it that why I can't eat? this product, why I cannot eat chicken, why why no soy, you know, so then I was like getting curious and start learning more about it. And uh, instead of just blindly following. So this is helpful if you are a caregiver or you have friends and family who are diagnosed with cancer. Just find out why. Uh, what type of exercise does my body need? What can it handle? Uh, how do I boost my immune system? And I continue to learn through the many survivors that I met through um, Breast Cancer Foundation. Uh, I learned like um, meditation to calm my monkey mind. And sometimes with, can with cancer, we just like stay awake at night and then think this, think that, oh my God, is this going to happen? And that's not helpful at all. So I find that uh, learning some coping technique to uh, help ourselves is important. And I took up a lot of courses to help understand the human mind. Why we think that, why why we always have all this worst case scenario in our head. And, and I find that, and then, then it, somehow it led me to a new career as a, as a coach, as a life coach. So, um, so all those things is because of the attitude. I decided that in spite of cancer, I want to enjoy the journey. And uh, this is why I adjusted accordingly along the way. And I think that is, is something that uh, cancer have taught me too. And even with an, an unexpected journey, it can bring surprises and uh, learn to am admire what's along the way. So I, I aspire to inspire before I expire. So that's one of my mantra. Um, balance. So cancer taught me that a lot of things is all about balance. So we want to be mindful of our action, our thoughts and our choices. Uh, so when somebody says diet, right? So what we don't want to be too extreme. Oh, I to totally turned vegetarian. I'm not going to eat meat again. No, that's on the extreme end. When uh, so we want to be mindful about what we eat because we want to balance. Our body needs that. And even stress, we can say that. Oh no, I don't want any stress at all. No, some some bit of stress is good, but we don't want to be too too much of a stress, too sad, too happy. Two extremes are no good, so always keep in mind when something is not right for you, ask yourself what is off balance? Uh, is it because I'm I, I partied too much last night? Uh, is it because I ate too much? I ate buffet, so that's why I'm not feeling so well today. So we want to strike that balance. So even sleeping too much is no good uh, enough to recharge our our human battery. I always say it's our human battery, so we just want to have enough of everything and just like riding a bicycle balancing. We just keep moving, just keep moving, keep ourselves on the on our toes and keep moving. So that's a good way to remember that uh, in life you will notice that a lot of things is about balance. So what is out of balance? Look for it and then try to rebalance it again. The fourth uh, life lesson that uh, cancer taught me was gratitude. Um, so what what are you grat grateful for? Uh, I am grateful that I did my self check early enough and found a lump because I found it at 32. So like uh, Michelle have indicated earlier, I was too young to be doing mammogram at that time, but I happened to do a self check and I found a lump early, so it was good. And I'm also thankful for the good medical system in Singapore and support resources like uh, Breast Cancer Foundation where they have support groups, we meet like minded uh, survivors and learn from them too. I'm also grateful that uh, I, I bought medical insurance that cover a lot of the expensive uh, expenses. Uh, I might come across like an insurance agent, but I'm not. I just feel that um, I, a lot of uh, women that I've spoken with, some of them, uh, other than the shock of uh, being diagnosed with breast cancer, they are also shocked by the amount of money that's involved. 
uh, for the medical treatment. So having adequate insurance is helpful. And I'm also grateful that uh, I have supportive family and friends um, throughout this journey and also grateful for a lot of new uh, possibilities, new possibilities to learn, to 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 yeah, just 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 um, just like how COVID is for I think many of you guys can relate uh, COVID, even though a lot of us don't like it, but it also brought a lot of new possibilities now that we can connect to uh, Zoom and learning to uh, in the comfort of probably some of you at home. So these are all new possibilities that uh, uh, so-called a crisis brought. And uh, so we just have to look around us and ask ourselves, what can we be grateful for? All the little things in life. And I just want to add also, sometimes we forget how precious it is just to be alive. And self-care is really, really important. I can't emphasize enough, it's, it's like, um, so going for checks and all this is part and parcel of self-care. We don't want to wait until cancer comes for it to be your teacher. So we want to build up our immunity to make sure that our emotional bank is as healthy uh, level as our financial bank. So just like COVID, you know, if your immunity is stronger, the chances of you getting COVID is less. So it's the same thing with cancer. So we want to make sure that emotionally, physically, financially, we are all on the good side so that whatever comes along, uh, we are in a good, uh, good space to handle. And I hope that uh, through my stories and through some of the life lessons that cancer have taught me, it will inspire you in some way uh, in, in, in your life or not, not just specifically for cancer. And you can also share those stories with uh, somebody that you're caring for uh, who's affected by cancer. So different seasons, there are different reasons. So just embrace it as it comes. And I guess change is the only constant for us and always ask ourselves, what are we grateful for? And with this, I end my sharing and cancer can only take away my hair, but not my smile and attitude. So this was me when I was uh, newly diagnosed, undergoing um, chemotherapy. So I lost all my hair, but uh, I, my friends and I decided to throw a pink party. So everything we want to be in the pink of health. So everything was pink, pink, pink. The food was pink. My clothing was pink, except my son. He refused to wear anything pink. So there he is in, in blue. <laughs> so uh, that's it for my uh, presentation. And again, my name is Trisha Pang. And um, to, um, uh, let me just stop my sharing for now. And there we go. Thank you for listening. So, um, oh, okay. Thanks, Trisha. Thank you so much. And thank you so uh, much. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your story and really inspiring for all of us. And uh, it's very important to stay positive and stay strong. That's how you know what what we learn. And one thing which I really you know uh, uh, noticed, you know, uh, we should learn you know how to stay positive and we should value the life you know what we have right now. Yeah. So so and with this, I guess, we only during that time. I think it's good to have uh, to build out our emotional bank. Especially mm -hmm. times like this, just to have it, uh, it's just like the money, right? A financial bank. We, we save up, but we need to save up on the good stuff. And uh, so it becomes a habit. It becomes a part and parcel. So whatever comes along, we are able to deal with it. Whether it's health issue crisis, whether it's financial crisis, job crisis, whatever comes along, I think we will have the mental capacity to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. So with this, uh, Thank you, and uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Lee Kuek Eng. So let me start presenting from my slide. So we have a third presenter, Dr. Lee Kuek Eng. Uh, Dr. Lee graduated from National University of Singapore with a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. After having obtained a Bachelor of Science in Cell and Molecular Biology, so she completed her medical oncology specialist training in 2013 and went on to practice medical oncology at National Cancer Center, Singapore. Dr. Lee specializes in breast cancer, specifically focusing on young women with breast cancer and research. For her work in breast cancer, she was awarded International Fellowship at MRC Research Grant in 2016 to train as a fellow at Tana Faber Cancer Institute focusing on young women with breast cancer 
and pregnancy associated breast cancer. Dr. Lee has a strong focus on research and has been involved in a number of Singapore studies, including identifying the barriers to trial population amongst the Asian population and young women with breast cancer. She was involved in a setting up national program for young women with breast cancer to help increase awareness and education. She was also awarded a second grant under the Industry Alignment Fund by NMRC for her research in a novel compound for treatment for brain metastasis in advanced breast cancer patients. She represented Singapore in numerous overseas international oncology conferences and presented her research, uh, her work extensively over the last years. So with this, uh, Dr. Lee, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just open up my deck. So thank you, Trisha, for the very inspiring sharing. I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for the introduction. So, you know, this month is October, so we are into the ECAP. So we have to focus on breast cancer and how to protect ourselves. And I think to echo what the previous two speakers spoke on, I think even like, you know, for young women, it's very important to be vigilant and to take care of yourself and to do breast self-examination. I can't stress that enough. So let's move on. Um, so Dr. Nitin has already kindly introduced me. Um, basically, my interest is in uh, female cancers, mainly in breast cancers. And I do a lot of work on young women with breast cancer. So in fact, when I train in Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Dana-Farber was the first institute in US that actually came up with their Young Women Cancer Program. So having come back from the, the traineeship, I set up a Young Women Cancer Program, which is also the first in Singapore in Icon Cancer Center now. And I think it's a very important initiative, just like what BCF has done to set up a Young Women Support Group. I think it's very timely and there are more and more young women with breast cancer. So these programs are all in good time. So just to say, um, talk about the scope of this presentation. So today I will just touch on the burden of breast cancer, symptoms, risk factors, breast cancer in young women, and also a little bit about fertility preservation. And then I will move on and finish up with facts and needs. So um, with that, I will move on to the burden of cancer in Singapore. If we look at the graph, I think because it's a BCAM month, I, I think everyone must have heard some breast cancer talk and this graph is not unfamiliar to most of us. We can see that, you know, looking at the pink line, the incidence of breast cancer in Singapore has really increased tremendously. If we compare like 70s to now, the, this number has actually tripled. But I think we don't just want to focus on the bad news. If we look at the cancer mortality rate, we do see that the cancer mortality rate is actually more or less stable, and that is um, reflected in the graph below. And the reason being, I would like to say that it must be in part due to breast cancer screening, because breast cancer screening essentially helps to tease out you know, early cancer, which can then be fully cured. I think before we move on further, let's talk about what are the common breast cancers. Most of the time, you know, when we talk about breast cancer, we just know that the cancer arises from the anterior part of the chest, but exactly where we may not know. So if we look at the structure, we can see that the breast is made up of a few structures like the muscle, the fat, the connective tissues, the lobules that makes up the milk and also the ducts that convey the milk from the lobules to the nipple. So the most common cancer actually arises from the ducts that convey the milk from the lobules to the nipple. It's called invasive ductal carcinoma, and it makes up for about 70% um, of the cancer incidence. The rest, probably about 20, 30%, they are composed of invasive lobular carcinoma, which, which comes from the lobules. 
maybe about you know less than five percent will belong to the rare subtype. So we focus really on ductal carcinoma and lobular carcinoma, which together they make up for more than 90% of the breast cancer subtype. So what are the common symptoms? I think uh, just now Michelle probably went through them briefly. So indeed, you know, the most common symptoms are breast lump, lump in the armpit, even changes in the shape or symmetry of the breast or persistent skin changes or even like frank nipple discharges or bleeding or nipple retraction or even pain. However, you know, if you don't do your breast self-examination, you will not find all this. It's like um, taking, you know, a lesson from Trisha's story. If she didn't do the uh, breast self-examination when she was 32, she might have missed the diagnosis. So having said that, even though these symptoms can prompt you to be alert and to seek medical advice, not all of these symptoms are associated with cancer. They could be associated with just benign breast disease. So the take home message will be if you find something new and something that is persistent, do seek medical advice early. So next, we want to talk about risk factors associated with breast cancer, mainly because we want to know what we can actively do to change them and to improve you know, our risk profile. So usually for risk factors, I like to dichotomize it into modifiable and non-modifiable. Of course, what we want to do is to act on the modifiable. We can't do anything about the non-modifiable, unfortunately. So what are the modifiable risk factors? They include sedentary lifestyle, obesity, alcohol consumption, smoking, taking hormones in the form of hormone replacement therapy or certain types of oral contraceptive pills. So the non-modifiable risk factors include being female, something we can't change, and aging, we can't change that. But we can age gracefully while you know staying vigilant about our body and go for regular screening. So race, certain race, and of course, a strong family history can predispose to getting breast cancer. Early minake, meaning early start of menstruation, late menopause, because it really exposes our body to female hormones. And this is the same reason for delayed or no childbearing, because when we have no childbearing, we don't interrupt the menstrual cycle. So overall, the exposure of the body to female hormone is relatively higher. And for some patients like women or men, they may have childhood disease, so they, that requires um, chest irradiation. So this will then predispose them to getting cancer at a much later age. What can we do? I think I can't stress this enough. We really need to lead a healthy lifestyle. We should consider exercising on a regular basis. Try not to drink or at least cut down on drinking alcohol quit smoking and keeping a healthy weight. So what does WHO recommend? WHO really recommends that we do at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise and two times a week of muscle strengthening exercise. I think it's, it's easy to say it, it's not that easy. Even um, I have problem adhering to this, but I do try to exercise, you know, like five to six times a week. But if we divide 150 minutes into like, um, like five, then we need to do at least 30 minutes five times a week, which is um, quite, quite a difficult goal, considering that it's moderate intensity exercise we are talking, talking about. So, you know, not just like shopping in a mall, we need to get our heart going, pumping and sweat it out. That's considered exercise. So, how to make it easier? I mean, the way I see it, we should do something we really like. And look at this. I mean, I, I'm into hiking. So this, this is a really good hike that I had like last year before COVID. Um, this is the Mont Blanc tour. So essentially it's a hike that comprises um, three countries. So we crosses the Italy, France, Switzerland borders. So we did this hike over seven days and we are rewarded with the lovely views. So the way I look at it, if you want to do something consistent and you know not so easy, maybe it's easier to do it with someone uh, you like, a good company or good companies like you know the happy group there. 
So we were all like um, euphoric from the hike. I think easier to find a good company than like slowly, you know, transit from walking to hiking to running or even just um, um, other, other activities like, you know, tennis, badminton and all that. So coming to this like American Institute for Cancer Research on cancer prevention recommendation, I think most of this are uh, what we have spoken about just now. Um, be physically active, eat a diet rich in whole grain, vegetables, fruit and beans. Try to limit red processed meat, fast food. Limit consumption of sugar. I will touch on this later, again in the myth and fact section. And of course, limit alcohol. Do not use supplement, mainly they are talking about do not overuse supplement and do not take too, too much supplements, basically. And also, um, okay, so for this one, so I'll just move this up. So, um, of course, for mothers, try to breastfeed and for cancer survivor, follow a surveillance plan, you know, like for, <clears throat> sorry. For breast cancer survivors, you have to go for your yearly mammogram, go for it, don't skip it. So this is what it means. Okay. So really, um, I think this has been repeated again and again. Try not to miss the breast cancer screening. Um, we do have a national program for screening. So for women above 50 years of age, once every two years, between 40 to 49, once a year. For younger women, who has a significant family history or even personal risk, they may need to be screened at an even earlier age. So it's really case by case. So do talk to your oncologist or your doctor. And it really involves mammogram. So what is mammogram? It's actually an X-ray picture of the breast. So a lot of people like what Michelle said, you know, may complain that it's painful, etc. But really it depends on individual and our each of us, our pain threshold, right? Um, so likewise, I've gone for mammogram and to me, it's, it's not really painful. It may be uncomfortable, but you know, uh, it is generally a very fast procedure. Some tips, try not to arrange for mammogram before or during your period because your breast can be very tender or sensitive. Uh, try not to wear perfume or deodorant because you do not want to have to repeat it because it can affect, the chemicals can affect the image. So why is this um, topic important? Let's switch guilt to this young women with breast cancer. And by young, um, different country have different definitions. Some country may have definition below 50, some has definition below 45, um, but generally we are referring to age 40 and below. So I think it's easier to appreciate this number in Singapore, especially if we compare it to the Western population. In Western population, the proportion of breast cancer below 40 years is probably about 4 to 7 percent. But in Asia, this number is much higher. In Singapore alone, if we look at the population below 44 years of age, we are looking at 18, 19 percent of breast cancer population. And this is really quite significant when we have, have another number to, to contrast it to, you see. But general treatment principles do not differ. Um, it still really depends on, you know, the biology of the disease, the subtype of the disease. But in this talk, I will not go into treatment per se. And um, yeah, so we'll just talk about the general challenges and psychosocial issues. So why, why do we have to, you know, um, put this group of patients in a different category? I think mainly because, you know, we have to consider numerous psychosocial issues that young women may face. So what are some of the psychosocial issues? Basically, they are young, you know, like they may be starting their career, they may be um, juggling young families, or they may not have started their family because more and more women are postponing marriage and childbirth. So a lot of times, you know, I see a lot of young women with the breast cancer diagnosis, and most of the time, you know, when they see me with the diagnosis, they have not even completed their family. So this is an added stress. And of course, when we talk about peer pressures, their peers may be at a different point in their life, and hence all this can contribute to them having issues with their sexuality, fertility, relationship issues when they compare with their peers. 
and also the treatment may cause them to have body image or even self-image issues. And all this together can affect their adherence and compliance to treatment. So of course, the final two medical thing that we have to consider for them is fertility preservation, as well as hereditary disease possibility. And next, I'll just talk a little bit about how they respond to treatment and how their body can respond differently. So basically, when we talk about hormonal treatment in young women, usually it involves some degree of you know, suppressing the female hormones. And for the younger women, like less than 35 years, who are hormone positive, we may even advocate uh, ovarian suppression. That means suppressing the ovary and then uh, rendering the estradiol to very, very low level. Basically, they are Cause. So for this young women, they may have more side effects because imagine their hormone drives are much higher than their older counterpart and suddenly you are shutting them down, right? So sometimes they can get a lot of um, hormonal endocrine side effects like hot flushes, mood change, depression, insomnia, weight gain, which then affect their body image issues, osteoporosis, etc. So they do have all this, you know, side effects from treatment, they have to grapple with these side effects as well. At the same time, considering you know finances, employment, and if they have young kids, um, taking care of a young family. So all these are you know potential source of stress, and added together, it can be very overwhelming. So why is fertility preservation important? First of all, for these young women, like what I mentioned. By the time they, they get a breast cancer diagnosis, they may not have completed their family. So it's really important because, you know, um, also they have with improved survival now, like we can uh, have a five year survival rate for stage one cancer of up to 90 percent. We are talking about, you know, this patient surviving for longer and longer. And if they are young, they really have years ahead of them. And we want them to have good quality of life after a breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. And we want them to be able to pick up their lives from before diagnosis. They are able to look forward to a fulfilling life of getting married and having kids. So that's why fertility preservation is very important. So when we see a young woman, what happens is that we really have to establish if their family planning is completed. So um, we really need to ask a lot of questions, you know, like personal questions. Um, and sometimes we need to send them to a gynecologist or obstetrician for them to get a power assessment. And some of the common questions that they usually ask will be, can I check my fertility level before treatment? Will my age affect my fertility? What are my chances of getting pregnant after treatment? And how can I try to preserve fertility and still have childbearing after the treatment? So fertility 101, I think just some background. Women are born with a fixed number of eggs and this number really do decline, including the quality of the eggs. So by the time menopause um, sets in about 50 years of age, the ovaries really stop releasing the eggs. So when we talk about likelihood of subfertility with a breast cancer treatment, we have to consider what are the types of drugs used, what is the dose, the current age of diagnosis, and what was the fertility level before treatment. And we have to consider the fertility treatment before even starting the systemic treatment. A lot of women may, you know, um, decide that, no, 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 this is not for me because it's going to delay my treatment. I just want to get the treatment done. It's not uncommon because usually when they are diagnosed and you know, they have a lot of information being thrown at them and they just want to get on with treatment. They, they will be very overwhelmed. So we, we usually need to sit them down and talk to them, um, maybe get them to really see themselves outside the current situation to think about, you know, their future. Because, you know, once the systemic treatment is done, the damage is done, it's not that easily salvageable. And with modern technique, um, usually fertility preservation can be done within two to three weeks. And, you know, sometimes you, you need even two to three weeks to get, you know, um, all the investigations, the uh, core biopsy, to analyze the result and to plan what to do. So basically what I'm trying to say is that 
With modern techniques, the fertility treatment is no longer a lengthy treatment that requires us to postpone the systemic treatment to an extent that can affect the outcome. So it's not that. So what are some of the common cryo uh, fertility preservation techniques? So in Singapore, um, the, our gold standard is always embryo cryopreservation or oocyte cryopreservation. But by Singapore law, um, embryo cryopreservations can only be done for legally married couple. Other methods include ovarian tissue preservation or even ovarian suppression, even though this is not the gold standard, it's one of the options if the patient cannot go ahead to do the uh, embryo cryopreservation or oocyte cryopreservation. So lastly, we can't, you know, uh, not talk about the Angelina effect when we talk about young women breast cancer. So when when a young woman is diagnosed, of course, you know there is a possibility of BRCA1 two mutation, um, and that that basically that predisposes them to hereditary condition that um, uh, predisposes them to get breast cancer. So not you know not all young women will have a BRCA1-2 mutation. In fact, the percentage of uh, BRCA1-2 mutation is not high, it's probably uh, 5 to 10%. But for any young women, there's always a chance and the chance is higher than their older counterpart. So they have to consider getting genetic testing for that. Uh, it is not a must, but you know, they need to go through a pre-test counselling to know the pros and cons before making the decision. And after the testing, they will still need a post-test counselling and to talk about risk-reducing surgeries. So this cartoon really illustrates that um, the discussion is not a simple one. It usually you know, happens over multiple consults. So in, in our cancer center, we do recognize that, you know, younger women, they are a unique group. And when they are diagnosed with uh, breast cancer or even other cancer, they really have to navigate through, you know, issues like psychosocial issues, fertility issues, medical financial issues. Hence, we have set up a, a women, young women cancer program spe specifically to target all these issues, to navigate through this. Uh, in a step-by-step -step way while ensuring that they get timely treatment for their, their cancer. So lastly, I just want to touch a little bit on breast cancer myth. I think, I think uh, the two speakers has probably already mentioned a little bit. A few of these myths are, con uh, are you know, due to a false sense of security, like some women may feel that, you know, uh, only older women are at risk, or as long as I exercise and lead a healthy lifestyle, I don't have to worry, or even as long as I go for regular mammogram, I'm safe. But all this basically just reduce the risk, but doesn't eliminate it. I think um, we still have to be very vigilant, we still have to do our regular self breast examination to ensure that we pick up any changes in a timely fashion. The last point I want to touch on is consuming too much sugar. So you may um, see like, you know, on the web, a lot of like articles saying that sugar can feed cancer, etc. But I just want to clarify, sugar doesn't cause the cancer directly. In an indirect way, if, the sh if you know, anyone who eats too much sugar can cause, can lead to obesity. And obesity is then a risk factor for breast cancer. So they are not directly linked, but indirectly, basically, you know, uh, obesity, increased fat, all this can increase risk to breast or even colon cancer. So with that, I want to urge all of us to stay safe, stay vigilant, do regular breast self-examination, and of course, stay positive. So with that, thank you. I finished my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very informative and I'm sure our audience have learned a lot from, from you. So I will, I will request Diana to take a few questions. So what do you, Diana? Is, 
search uh, for reliable information because there are so much information and misinformation on the internet. See where is a place good for um, searching and doing research. Okay. Okay, so I'll take that. Uh, so usually, you know, um, when you do Google search, I, I would advocate like for, for like most of us, if we are looking for medical information, we should go to, you know, sites recommended, like, you know, government sites, government link sites, like, you know, UK uh, Cancer Research has a very good site um, that has a lot of information on cancer. In fact, um, AACR, the American Cancer Research, also has a lot of uh, information on cancer research as well as cancer, basic uh, information on cancer. So I would say go for the legitimate sites. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, there's another question. Uh, just now you have mentioned about the Angelina Jolie effect. There's a question on that part, uh, that part and, and the question asking, would you recommend genetic screening for BRCA and HER2 and maybe other biomarkers to become a more routine um, screening rather than just uh, mammograms yearly? Well, I think that question is really um, quite a complex one because, you know, um, her two, her two is actually a type of receptor subtype, right? It, de it determines, um, it's not only prognostic, it's predictive, meaning it predicts response to like treatment. So for her two, et cetera, we do it on a routine basis for breast cancer patients because that really helps to guide treatment. So for a patient who is HER2 positive, then they will be treated with anti-HER2 therapy. So we know that because it's prognostic, it tells us you know, whether the disease do well or don't do as well. It's predictive because it predicts whether the treatment is useful. So that's for the HER2 biomarker. However, when we talk about genetic screening for like BRCA1 or 2, it really boils down to like, you know, um, at this point, we only screen patients with uh, index case, meaning they have the breast cancer and they have a significant history. The reason being, you know, um, all this test is not it's not so easy because you see before the test, we still have to consider pre-test counseling. After the test, we have to consider post-test counseling. The reason why we advocate all this counseling is because it's not just a test result. It's a test result that has a lot of implication. So for example, if you are tested positive, then you have to worry, how about, um, can I still buy insurance? How about my children? How about my siblings? How about my sister? So all this can have impact on your family member, on insurance, on even, you know, employment. So when you, when you go for interviews and all that, you have to submit your medical history and all that. So in US, there is a GINA code that, you know, uh, prevents discrimination for people who are screen positive. Um, well, Singapore has not at that stage yet, but of course it doesn't stop us from working towards that state, right? So at this point in Singapore, um, it does have a lot of implications, not only for yourself, but also for your immediate family members or even your relatives, you see, first degree relative. So it's not a simple, you know, just do it. You have to consider all this implication. So if there are so many issues to consider, how can it be for the, the general population? Cannot. There's another question. There's another question. Uh, what are the chances of survival? Should one be diagnosed with breast cancer? I think this is quite a general question. Yeah. Yeah. So when, it, when you talk about survival rate for breast cancer, I mean, it really depends on the stage. So we have stage one, two, three, four. Um, for stage four disease, even though, you know, it's not curable, but we do have patients, um, first of all, it's highly treatable. We have a lot of drugs now for treatment of stage four cancer. So that's one thing. And the second thing is that we have a lot of um, you know, long-term survivors, people surviving for up to, you know, five years, 10 years, even with stage four cancer. It really depends and boils down to the subtype of the cancer. For the treatable ones, like stage one to three cancer, then the survivor really depends on like which stage. 
like just now what I mentioned for stage one, we are talking about a five year survival rate of like, you know, 90%, stage two probably 80%, stage three we are talking about um, usually 60-70%. So I would say, you know, like over the years, um, with all the, you know, invent, invention of newer drugs, we are really seeing a higher and higher number, which is a really good thing. Um, mentioning about sugar intake and obesity, just now you have uh, actually gone through with us about the myth and that of uh, sugar intake and obesity. But the, the question I believe is like, why do women uh, who are obese have a higher chance of getting breast cancer? So, you know, actually, um, fats in our body, it does produce hormones, you see. So even in studies done uh, for breast cancer survivors, um, studies have done and shown, shown and, you know, they dichotomized and they, sub, they did a subset analysis. The uh, women with a higher BMI who are associated with obesity, they tend to do much worse in terms of breast cancer outcome. So basically, our female fat cells produces hormones. So can't stress enough to to exercise, to lead a healthy lifestyle and keep within a good BMI. Cheryl Cheryl has a question on breastfeeding. So she asked, will prolonged breastfeeding, like say beyond six months, reduce the risk of breast cancer? So breastfeeding is um, shown to have a positive effect to reduce the risk of breast cancer. Usually we are talking about, you know, a uh, substantial uh, length of time. So if you're asking like is six months enough, then yes, it is. Um, the recommendation is six months to a year. Um, however, I don't think that is, at least not to my knowledge, that breastfeeding beyond one year, like with increasing number of years, it improves the outcome very much. Anyway, it's not exactly practical to breastfeed for that long, right? In, especially in Singapore where, you know, we have to go back to work. <laughs> I actually breastfed over a year, so for my yeah. first son and then my, my daughter over six months. So I, I would say I wouldn't say that use breastfeeding only as an insurance against breast cancer. I would still think that it's important to do self-check because at that time it was thought that it was a blocked milk duct uh, that was causing it uh, the lump, which I've also heard in from our young women support group. Actually, quite many of them do breastfeed and they they also suspected it was a blocked milk duct that uh, instead of cancer. So we never even connected that because we thought, oh, OK, because we breastfed, we are OK. So that could also be a false uh, uh, security. Yeah, so it's important to note that. La. Of course, it's good to breastfeed. La. I mean, more for the bonding part and all the goodies and stuff like that. But in general, just I, I think we just want to say that be aware that it's not because, you know, like I think just now the slide shows 70% of us did not have any of those factors. Um, and it's important to note that because many will not check because they will think that I eat healthy, I exercise, I breastfed, I, I have all the check marks so I wouldn't have breast cancer. So that's the false assumption because I would say maybe oh, 10 women I meet, maybe all eight of them fall into that category. And uh, so it's... So it's it's good to know that. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Lee has another question uh, from Irene. She asked if uh, if one person has a breast cancer, does it increase the risk to get other types of cancer? Uh, if so, which are the more common ones? Well, I mean. If you have an isolated case of cancer and you don't have any hereditary disease syndrome, as in, you know, like, um, for example, like BRCA1 and BRCA2, they actually predispose you to uh, basically a spectrum of cancers, not only just breast, but ovarian, and even in male, you can get pancreatic or prostate cancer. So basically, it's a is related to a hereditary disease syndrome. So if you just get breast cancer and you are not tested positive for the, the a disease syndrome, then it's very unlikely for you to get other kind cancer. However, if you have breast cancer, that is a risk factor for you to get 
uh, future breast cancer, which is why, you know, we still treat and we try to reduce recurrence with adjuvant treatment. So for hormone positive disease, we treat with five to 10 years of hormone treatment. And uh, for like hormone negative or HER2 positive, we treat with targeted treatment and chemotherapy. There's just one last question that we have here. So the uh, person asked if, uh, if will, will she have a high risk of any cancer uh, as a family member has a history of uh, pancreatic cancer? So could it be um, the person would get pancreatic cancer or any other type of cancer? This really requires a detailed study of the family history. I mean, it's not just enough to know of one other person with pancreatic cancer. You know, we need to draw a family tree and uh, tree, sorry, and we usually need to draw a tree, uh, tree layer, meaning like your not only so you need to involve your immediate like you know uh, offspring and then your parents and your grandparents and then we need to know at what age does um, the index person has the pancreatic cancer and then we need to look and study what other cancers are evident in the family tree before we can actually uh, make a call or make the advice for testing or not so what Final question, Dr. Lee, is about the um, well, uh, self breast, uh, um, you know, the monthly check. So, how do we detect the risk? Uh, I mean, the breast cancer, how does the lump actually feel like? So, for different people, it's very individual. For different people, the lump will feel <laughs> differently. It can be hard for some, it can be soft, and then it can be immovable, immobile for some, and then it can be, you know, uh, quite fixed for some. So uh, very difficult to explain, but you know, if you detect a lump, any lump, or, and if it's something new, you, you need to seek medical advice. So just to mention how to do it properly, I think uh, just now Michelle had a slide, right? I think it's very good. Just ensure, you know, every quadrant, every part, you can feel it. There are two areas that are commonly missed. That is under the armpit as well as under the nipple because it's very difficult to feel under the nipple. So what you need is to really fix one side and then you know just dig your hand under the nipple to feel it. It's not comfortable, but just try to do it, you see. And one other tip is to do it at a fixed time every month because you know if you do it like sometimes if you do it before menses and then sometimes you do it after your menses you can feel really different like for a lot of women before menses they get very lumpy breasts so my advice is always you know do it after the menses and have a fixed time so maybe you know if you consider uh the start of your menses as day one then you can choose to do it maybe at day five. That's when, you know, all the, you know, some people can get very edematous and then fluid retention and all that. So usually when you are at like maybe day three, four, five, the fluid will start to come, come off and then you'll feel like lighter. So I think that's when also your breast will feel like, you know, less tender, less lumpy, easier to feel for masses. So if you do it, do it at a regular time interval, do it like, every month at day five of your menses. So that will help. And if I can just jump in here as well, Dr. Lee, another part um, that sometimes the ladies don't realize is actually the, the chest area that you imagine is above your breast. So they don't think, and we've seen again members who have had lumps that are actually high up. And you know, it's just that in our minds as females, uh, when we say breast, we always just think very in a very localized fashion of what sticks out, <laughs> where actually, you know, the part that's above where, where it sticks out, um, beyond where it sticks out, is actually also constitutes as part of the breast area. So even the part where you think it's flat and bony, um, if you do get lumps there as well, um, it, it should be it should be checked. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, thank you, Tricia. We have come to the end of today's session. It was very informative. Uh, I believe that all the attendees have benefited a lot from this session. So once again, I'd like to thank you everyone for your time uh, this afternoon. So have a great day ahead. Thank you very much and see you next time. Bye-bye.
Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe.